Uh, so there was a there was a moment. I, I, for some reason, it's seared in my memory. Um, I was outside of. I don't know if it's Papa's or Papa's. I think it's Papa's. It's properly speaking. Uh, it's their barbecue place in Houston. So they, you know, Papa's has got. We're gonna roll with Papa's, right? I just need some confirmation from the crowd. Okay, all right, we're gonna roll with Papa's. Um, yeah, they, they've got tons of great restaurants, right? But they got a they got a, a good barbecue place. It's not better than Brendan's, but it's good. Um, and I had had lunch with a friend, and I got back in the car, and I'd probably been a believer for about two years. I had recently just begun to feel as if God, you know, was good. I, <laughs> I don't know why it's so hard to believe that, but I think it is a lot of times. Um, but for some reason that day, I, I, I wasn't, I don't know, it was, it was odd, but I, I was in the car and I had just gotten, and I probably had it for three or four months, I'd gotten this sweet mountain bike and they had just finished the trails um, right over here by campus, like the actual like mountain bike trails, you know, um, and I got in this sweet mountain bike. I didn't have much else at that time. Uh, I had a, an old truck a very tiny house with a hole in the floor that I was paying like $400 a month for. And I just covered that hole up with my couch uh, that I had already had for a very long time. But I got this sweet, specialized, specialized as the brand, white mountain bike where you could lock the, you could lock the front shock so you could like ride on the road. And then you could like peel out right into the, right into the trails and unlock the shocks and right. This guy, you look at me like, this guy's a real athlete, and I didn't know I am. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, love the bike, love the bike. And I, I was like riding the trails a little bit and getting the hang of it, sort of. Um, well, anyways, in the car outside of, of Papa's, and uh, I was overwhelmed with guilt for having the bike. Just overwhelmed with it. And it was like... I was wrestling with, was it okay? And I couldn't put it into words, but I was wrestling with, was it okay to have this nice thing? And I, I wanted to serve God really well, and I wanted to please God. You know, that's really what my heart was been on. Like, I wanted to please God. I was two years into following him. I had spent a lot of time not following him in my life, and I was bent on pleasing him, you know? And so this, and, and maybe it wasn't guilt, but it was just, you know, it was wrestling. But it, it felt a little like guilt, for lack of a better word. Um, and so I remember being there and just in my car saying the words, fine, God, fine, fine, fine. I'll give it away. I'll give it away. And I call uh, a friend of mine um, who was discipling a guy that was uh, getting into bikes. And I was like, I want to give Chris my bike. I was not at all a joyful or cheerful giver. And he's like, wow. And I, so I, and I gave him the bike. And I think he thought it was going to be like an old, you know, like the old Walmart mountain bikes that like make a lot of noise when you're on like, you know. And then when you shift them, they don't really shift until you shift them three times and they do a massive shift and then the, train, the chain breaks off. Yeah. And it wasn't that. And so he called me a few days later and he was like, this is in incredible. Like, this is an incredible bike. Thank you so much. I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm super great. <laughs> and I've, you know, I've wrestled with that, that moment a lot. And I think the more that I get to know the Lord, the more I come to terms with, with Him. I don't think that it had anything to do with the Holy Spirit whatsoever. I just don't. Um, at that time in my life, I had a, uh, I had a category for serving God. I had a category for what it, what it meant to follow him. I had a category for what it meant um, for me to figure out what it takes to make him happy. You know what I did not have a category for? I did not have a category for him loving me and giving me good things. I didn't have a category for him serving me. Even for some of y'all, that's weird for me to say, and that's fine. Hopefully we'll make it through the sermon and that'll change. But I didn't have a category for what it meant for him to give and to desire to be pleasing to me. I only had a category 
for being a servant. I didn't have a category for being a son. I didn't know what that meant. Um, and so with my very strong and developed category for serving him, the only way I could understand receiving a good thing was to give it away because I'm not supposed to have good things because I'm a servant. Which incidentally, the Bible never once called, well, in the New Testament never calls Christians servants. Paul will call himself that a few times, but he never calls other Christians that incidentally. He calls them sons. And so I had this really developed category um, and this really undeveloped category. And, and, and the categories are something like this. Um, and I think, I think many of us may be kind of similar in that. Um, that we have a highly developed category for what God wants from us. But we have a very undeveloped category of what God wants to be for us. And so I think many of us have consigned ourselves to being servants in the house of God instead of sons in his house. And, and with that, servants exist to do what the master says. And sons exist to enjoy the father and the fruits of his house while we learn to represent him well in the world. One is complex. And the other is kind of simple. One is beautiful and joyful and life-giving and full of positive motivation to grow and transform and develop. And the other one is filled with punishment and accusation and fear and begrudging obedience. And they're very, very different. Uh, and so kind of wh where we're going to go today is we are back in the Gospel of John. We're going to be in God, John 13. We have been studying John prior to the merger, prior to the summer, literally prior to COVID. I don't know if we've been in John for a very long time. <laughs> but we are jumping back in to finish the, the Gospel of John uh, and where we find ourselves now at this huge transition period in the book. And that transition period is where... Jesus is now preparing himself and his followers um, for his trial, for his crucifixion, for his resurrection and ascension. And John takes a uh, half of his book to develop that whole week. So he spends the first half of his book on the life of Jesus, and the entire second half of his book he spends on the last week prior to Jesus' crucifixion. And the story we find ourselves in today is, I think, it's a familiar story. It's the story where Jesus, um, the night before he's going to be betrayed and the night before uh, he's going to face some unjust trials um, and ultimately be uh, condemned by uh, the Jews and the Romans and go to a cross, the night before that whole thing begins, he finds himself celebrating the Passover meal, which is a Jewish celebra celebratory meal, um, and uh, it's a story that I think we know where prior to that meal, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples on the way to that really intense week. So let's pick it up. Let's read there. Um, and I am going to stop kind of in the middle of this story and hammer a few things home because this is really what I want us to grab on today. So let's do that. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, also Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and he took a towel, he tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him.
We'll stop there for a minute. Um, do you know what this coat does for me? It makes my shoulders look a little bit bigger. You know what I'm saying? Right? You know what else it does for me? It makes my waist look a little bit smaller. You know? It makes me have Blake Farrell's figure. You know what I mean? Like the V, you know? But you know what happens when I take my coat off? I'm not going to. I thought about it. (laughs) But I like this illusion. Um, You find out that my shoulders, well, they're not quite as, they're not quite as wide. You know what else you find out? Well, my waist, not so much here, but right back here, it just like pokes out more than I want it to, you know? I see it bad when I'm in a bathing suit and someone takes a picture of me from the back. And I'm like, ugh, that's not how I wanted that to look. And then if I take my shirt off, you know, you see it even more. You see my my disproportions. And you know these pants, they they deceive you. Because when I wear shorts, you can see that my my this part of my legs, they're real narrow. Without definition. And so I kind of like I kind of look like two sticks with like a rectangle body on top, you know? But when I wear these pants and this coat, I feel dignified, you know what I'm saying? I feel like like I can go out into the world and have an employee and ask them to do something and they're not like looking at me being like, Yeah, I'll do it, but you look weird, you know, (laughs) like that. But I mean, that 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 is historically what clothes have done for us. I mean, that that's why there's so many rules regarding the clothes that you wear in different cultures, because in different cultures, the clothes that you wear are about you remaining dignified, about you not losing dignity for some reason when. Your proportions are visible, your disproportions are visible. When you lose that 22 year old figure and, and, and the proportions change, and <laughs> you're right, I'll stop there. I will, I will. There's something about the way that we dress ourselves and it maintaining dignity and that undressing ourselves in front of other people somehow makes us feel exposed and vulnerable and maybe even less than we are or less than we're trying to be. And that's why there's really strict rules in the Jewish culture about your outer garment. Because the Jews, they looked a lot like me, I think. They never uncovered their legs and they didn't remove their outer garment in public because it made them look dignified and they didn't want to become undignified in the presence of other people. Unless perhaps you were a servant and you had to, because of the life you were dealt, you had to take your clothes off because you didn't have many clothes so that you could bend down and wash the dirt and the poop off of other people's feet before they would have dinner. And so you're seeing this incredible picture from Jesus. You're seeing this incredible picture. And it's doing two things. The first thing that it's doing is it is a a physical image of a spiritual reality that Jesus being divinity, not being disproportioned in any way, being perfect in every way. And like Davis was saying, like glory emanates from him and his 
essential state. And he can create things by speaking. And he can destroy things by speaking. And he can control anything he wants to control. And he can do anything he wants to do. And he laid aside that sort of power. He laid aside that sort of ability. He laid aside that sort of dignity. And he took on this <laughs> this disproportionate figure. And then after he did that, on his way to being crucified by the ones that he loved and to be crucified by the ones that he was giving his life for and to be crucified by the ones that he is trying to rescue out of the world that they're creating that's not a good world. On his way to that, he's still so confident in himself, confident in who he is, confident in what the Lord has him doing, fully understanding what he is and who he is. He takes off that outer garment with his legs exposed, his arms exposed, his tummy exposed because he would have had these big holes here because they weren't tailored real well. He wraps a towel around him and he gets down and he starts to take the feet of these disciples and to clean off the gross stuff that they gathered that day. Right? And so not only is it a picture of the spiritual reality of him laying aside divinity and taking on humanity, he's also showing this other thing that I want to dive into a little bit. He's showing them this transformative power that grace and goodness has over rightness or justice. He's showing them the transformative power that giving somebody something that they don't deserve He's showing them the transformative power of that. And he's showing it in this really powerful moment. And then oddly enough, if you know the Bible and you know the man named Peter, you know he handles this rather poorly. And so he comes to Simon Peter and he says, or he comes to Simon Peter and Simon Peter says to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but afterwards you will understand. And then Peter says to him, you will never wash my feet. You know, this is really uncomfortable for Peter. This is really uncomfortable. It's probably more uncomfortable than me taking off my jacket and my shirt here on stage, you know? Because if I'd have done that, y'all would have been uncomfortable. Some of you would have filmed it, not because you wanted to watch it later, but because you would have sent it to other people and be like, he did not just do that. But it's uncomfortable for Peter, and that's what I want to dive into. Why does Peter not want this to happen? Why is he willing to believe that Jesus is divine, can raise the dead, knows what he's doing and he's going to look at Jesus and say, you're not washing my feet, man. You are not going to wash my feet. Why does it make him so uncomfortable? And, and here's, where, here's where I think the answer is. I think Peter has a highly developed category for what it means to serve the divine. I think he has a highly developed category for what it means to be a servant. I think he has a highly developed category for the proper roles of divinity, the proper roles of a dignified human, and the proper roles for an undignified human. And Peter is already wrestling with the fact that Jesus has made one jump, but he is not okay with the fact of him making that next jump. And he's certainly not okay with the fact of him making that jump to serve him. Because he has a highly developed category for what it looks like for a human being to relate to a divine being. And when a human being relates to a divine being, it should always be in service and submission and never in the context of being served. 
do you realize as well that every religion on the face of this planet has that exact same category? Every religion that conceives of earthly beings and divine beings conceives of that relationship in the terms of what that earthly being needs to do to make that divine being happy with them. What that earthly being needs to do to serve the needs of that divine being because that divine being is greater. And in this world, the only way that we as human beings know how to comprehend that context is that the lesser serves the greater. And Peter is okay with that reality because that reality is fair and right and just. He is content with that reality because it's right and fair and just. And what we find that he is not okay with is a reality where the greater is serving the lesser. Where he is receiving something he does not deserve. That makes him uncomfortable. And do you know it probably makes you uncomfortable too? Do you know you, whenever you do well, you tell yourself really good things. Like, man, I killed it. Just killed it today. And you know, when you do poorly, you tell yourself really terrible things. If you said the things to other people when they fail that you say to you when you fail, they would not be friends with you anymore. But because we like rightness and justice, and things making sense, and getting what we deserve, and giving what we deserve, or giving what other people deserve, we are fine failing, and then whipping ourselves mentally that we're so terrible, and we deserve this. Thinking that the divine in heaven, that God in heaven is looking down on that and being like, yep, you keep on spanking yourself, because I'm mad at you too. And when you feel bad enough, and it's been three or four days, and you kind of forget about it, we'll be okay again. But certainly, don't come talking to me. Because I don't like you very much right now. That's what we think (laughs) when we don't do well. And so Peter, like us, has a highly developed servant mentality. And you know what Jesus is trying to do in Peter? He's trying to develop a new mentality in him. And so Jesus' response to Peter is this. If I don't wash you, You don't have a share with me. If you don't let me do this, Peter, you're not one of my followers. If you don't let me treat you unfairly, you're not a follower of mine. If you don't let me serve you, you're not a follower of mine. If you don't let me give you something that you don't deserve, you don't have the capacity to follow me, Peter. How weird is that? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't compute. But that's because I've got an earthly mind, right? It's, it's this action that is so essentially powerful. And, and, and I want you to see, we see this somewhere else as well. We see this in the story of the prodigal son, right? You have a son who goes to his father and says, basically, I wish you were dead. Give me half of what we own now. I don't want to wait till you die. I want it now. 
and he goes and he wastes all of it. And then he finds himself with no money, nothing good, in the middle of a famine, far away from his father's house. And what he's doing there, now to make ends meet, he's feeding pigs, and he's Jewish, and so feeding pigs actually makes him unclean and unable to approach God anyway, or to approach his own father, anyone who's Jewish. So now he's cleaning, he's feeding pigs, and he's so hungry he wants to eat the pig food, and he has a thought. Man, the servants in my father's house at least have enough food. I'll go tell my dad. I'll go tell my dad that I'll be a servant in his house. And it'll at least be a better job than this. And I'll have enough food. So he makes his way back home. And you know how the story goes. The father sees him when he's a far away off. And you know what the father does? It says this, he lifts up his robe, ties it, which is undignified. An ancient Jewish man should never show this part of his leg because it's probably pasty white and weird looking and would make them look undignified. Secondly, he is a rich man and only people who work in the field tie up their outer garment so they can go to work. So he does not have a nicely tanned leg because he's not working in the field. He ties up that outer garment. You know why? So that he can run to his son. Oh my gosh. Yes. He runs to his son. And do you know the son starts to say, hey dad, like I'll just be a servant in your house. Like, I just, I, I'm so sorry, like I've sinned in front of you and I've sinned before God. And he starts his whole spiel. And what does the father do? Yes, I'd be happy to employ you at minimum wage. No, it's not what he does. He kisses his neck. Ah, oh, I love that. Because when you love your kids, you, you kiss them on the neck. And he says, get a robe for him and give him my ring so that everybody knows that he's mine. Make him a son again. Make him a son again. He gives him what he does not deserve and he serves him by taking the fattened calf that takes a year or more to get fat enough to be good. Because keep in mind, if you eat lean cows, it doesn't taste that good. It's chewy. It is chewy, right? <laughs> yes. And it's not really that great having a party with chewy beef. He spends a year fattening a calf for an important moment. And without hesitating, he says, go slaughter that thing. This is the moment. The greater steps in and serves the lesser because the greater wants to transform the heart of the lesser through grace and goodness and service. That's what he wants to do. And so Jesus... Well, hold on. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. And so Simon Peter says to him, <laughs> in Simon Peter fashion, well, then don't wash my feet. Wash my hands and my head also. <laughs> and, and Jesus says to him, look, man, you've already taken a bath. <laughs> not only do we not I'll just have a wash basin here, and we're not going to do all that, but you bathe, you don't need to wash except for your feet. Because your feet are dirty, the rest of you is clean. And he says, but not every one of you, because he knew he was, who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. So as I was jumping into this, this is the part that I was just like, why include that bit? Why include that bit about Peter and Wash all of me also, and him being like, no, I'm not. 
It's just your feet that I'm concerned with here. And I think it's this. I think it's an image of this. Because I don't think this text is just saying Jesus washed the disciples' feet because he wanted to show them that they should serve other people. I do think that's part of it. But I think this whole dialogue with Peter is here to show us another reality. And that other reality is this, that you don't have the capacity to serve like Jesus serves unless you are served by Jesus first. You don't have the capacity to love like Jesus loves unless you are loved by Jesus first. You don't have the capacity to sacrifice deeply for the cause of the kingdom of God until you have really sunk deeply in the amount of sacrifice that the Father in heaven has sacrificed for you. You just don't have the capacity to do it because you're an empty well with no water to give. That well's got to be filled up so that there's water to give out, right? You have to be fully drenched in the goodness of God towards you before you can go talking about the goodness of God for for other people. Because if you live in the servant mentality and you live in my father only gives me what I deserve and you live in the world that I'm only as good as the last thing that I've done, if you live in that world, that's the that's the way that you end up treating other people and that's the way that you end up talking about God. That's the place that you serve from. You serve because you're supposed to. Not because you've been so transformed by service that you couldn't possibly do anything else. And so being served in that way is an essential part of becoming who God would have you be. But it's so uncomfortable to be served in that way by Jesus. And I think what that looks like for you and me is locked into that story when Jesus tells Peter, you're clean, but not your feet. I think what's in there in an imagery sort of way is this. When you follow Jesus, you receive his spirit, you're made clean and you are able to interact with the divine without having to sacrifice a goat or a bull. You don't have to do anything to come into the presence of God. Even greater still, you don't have to do anything because you don't have to go into the presence of God. The presence of God has come into you because the blood of Jesus has washed you clean. Right? So even that reality is enormous. And so what he's saying is you are clean, man. But you know there's something that happens when me and you as clean people, we go out into this dirty world day after day, and we're judging between the gray because not everything's black and white. And we're trying to figure out what it looks like to be good parents, and we're trying to figure out what it looks like to be good employees and to be good bosses and to be good spouses, and we don't always know that we've done it quite right. We don't always know when we've stood up for the right things or when we back down for the wrong things. We don't really know when we've drawn the right line and or we haven't drawn the right line and maybe we're being too harsh or not harsh enough. Like, we live in this world where there's a lot of gray, and walking in and out of that gray world leaves you with a lot of accusations and a lot of frustration and a lot of fears and a lot of doubts that just run around in your mind because you don't know if you did everything just right. So you move into this dark world that's got a lot of frustrating things, a lot of dark things, a lot of selfishness, a lot of anger, and a lot of times when you meet all of that selfishness and that anger and that frustration, you know what ends up coming out of you is selfishness and anger and frustration. And it leaves you feeling like a little dirty, you know? Like, I get up early so I can spend at least 35 minutes with the Lord, like just kind of letting the Proverbs wash over me and letting the Psalms wash over me and like remembering that God is good and that He's here and that He cares and that Jesus has done so much already and, and like, I don't need to worry about all the stuff that's going to come at me that day. But literally within like a few minutes of just interacting with four kids, all that has gone like pretty far out the window. 
It's not all gone. And it was really good that I had it going into it, but it like wears you down fast. And so, you know, we're, we're in the middle of my oldest and, and you know, all the kids are going back to school and, and my oldest, he just, he's hard on himself. He doesn't get out of his own way. And so at school, you know, we've already had a parent-teacher conference, and I mean, they missed the first two weeks of school, and then so it was only three days into him actually being there that it's already a parent-teacher conference. And he's blurting out too much, and he talks too much, and he's a little obnoxious, and he's got too much energy, and and so can I kind of be off-putting to the other kids? They're like, geez, just settle down, man. And like I cherish the kid because I love the energy. I love it. I, I, he's, he's just a wonderful, special kid. Like I love him. But I know he doesn't get what he wants because he gets in his own way. And I can tell there's frustration with the teacher and, and all that. And so you know, I set up these hard line rules if you get a yellow day, you're in your room until dinner time. If you get an orange day, this happens. You get a red day, this happens. I'm like, he's definitely not going to get a red day. I mean, he'll kind of bump along. And then next week, it was yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red. And so, you know, Friday, it's like, no switch this weekend, buddy. And I'm kind of inside frustrated. I, I like... Where's the line? Where's the line? Where do I draw the line? Where do I draw the line? What's going on with you? I know you can be different, you know. And then by Saturday night, by like last night, he's just, he's just enough that I lose it on him before bedtime. Just lose it. You know what I mean? All of that's now pent up and I just lose it, you know. And so he's in the shower sitting on the floor. And I could tell like I hurt him, you know. And so he comes out of the shower, gets dressed, and I'm just sitting on the bed. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do, Jesus. I don't know what to do. And it was just, I got a sense of him there. You know, like, like on his knees, you know, like he was just like on his knees. And like had my feet and he was just taking the dirt and he was like, Terrell, I know you're trying hard. Like, I know you're trying hard. Let's get this off of you, man. It's not going to go this way forever. It's not just going to be bad all the time. Like, let's get this grime off you. You know, how bad you feel for getting angry and how confused you are about discipline and He's like, you know, he's just taking that stuff off. And it was there that when Marshall walks back in, that I'm like, I'm sorry, buddy. Like, I'm, I am sorry. What's going on at school? And it was like the first time I'd asked him, what's going on, little seven-year-old? You know, and he's like, well, I don't know. And he starts to tell me a story about Smash Brothers on Nintendo Switch. And I'm like, are you liking school? And then I could see his eyes do what my eyes do, you know? And you could see him well up a little bit. And he says, I, I think everybody in my class hates me this year, you know? And I'm like, ah. He says, they can be kind of mean to me, you know? And I'm like, buddy. I've been so concerned with giving him what he deserved. I've been so concerned with it because I thought giving him what he deserved would fix him. And that doesn't mean that there should be no discipline in the home. It doesn't mean that at all. But it should be a home where the boy can come in and I can take his little feet you know, and say, I know you're trying hard, man. 
I know second grade is not easy. I know what it's like to feel lost in an elementary school. I know what that feels like. And you're going to do so good. You've got nothing to worry about. And it's just wash those feet off, you know? Because it's grimy out there on the playground. Where you don't know if the kids are joking or if they're not joking. You don't know if they're being spiteful or if they just have a bad home life too. You don't know if they just have insecurities and so that's why they're kind of mean because that's the only way they can cover it up. It's grimy out there. And the home has got to at least be a place where he feels comfortable saying like, look at that stuff between my toes, Dad. I don't like it. Can you get that off? And me to not like, oh my gosh, your feet are dirty. But to just wash them up and say there's like, there's always room for that here. And so I don't think we have the capacity. I don't think we have the capacity to do that for other people. I don't have the capacity to do it for him until Jesus does that for me. And only when I allow Jesus to do that for me do I get to experience the steady flow of grace that's more than He died on a cross to wash you of your sins. Yeah, true. For sure, true. But that made me clean. I need Jesus every day to get the grime off, you know? Because the world, well, it's just the world. And so all I want for us this morning is like a fresh breathing in and breathing out of who Jesus is for you. And a willingness, just a willingness to own the idea that he would be for you. And that he longs to serve his sons and his daughters. Because he knows what that does. Is it creates in them the transformative experience by which they go and be like him in the world. Because the existence of humans in the ancient text was always to reveal who God is, not to serve God. That's what makes this beautiful relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel, and his son Jesus, and what's been extended to us, so much different than every other way that God and gods are talked about on this planet, and even the way that God is talked about inside of Christianity and shouldn't be. In this relationship with him, he longs to serve because he knows that cultivates service for other people. He longs to lavish love because he knows that cultivates love. He doesn't oppress with his expectations because he knows that doesn't transform. He just invites you into the freedom and goodness of being a citizen in his kingdom and a son and daughter in his house. That's really what I want us to do this morning is accept that as a reality and then allow him to wash us a little bit as we worship. So if you'd stand up, I want to pray for a second and then I want the band to lead us. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine kind of that stuff you want off of you. A way that you've been that you don't like. A way that you've said that you wouldn't be over and over again and you still find yourself that way. Just imagine it as dirt on your feet. And as we worship, just allow Jesus to come and be for you what he demands to be for you. And so we welcome you, Jesus, to do that very thing among us because we need you so badly to become 
who we're supposed to become, but also to enjoy life with you now.